We're going to start the sermon, okay? All right. So, how is everybody? I hope you were blessed. Were you here last night? How many of you here last night were blessed? Praise the Lord. We're right in the middle of our revival series. It's just, be we're not in the middle, we've begun. We started last night, amen? Uh, we had some amazing music. We had some uh, singing. We had some preaching about home. And how we, this world is our almost home. And by the things that we see around us, we know that we're almost home. But most of all, we've been talking about Jesus. Amen? And I hope that you took the time this morning to stop by our registration table. Because what you get when you go to our registration table is a beautiful Almost Home Revival Series folder. And along with that, you pick up the study guide. How many of you like the study guides this year? Right. Amen. Praise the Lord. And as I said last night, these are fold at your own risk. I like my, my, my things folded neatly and even, so I'd rather fold myself. I'd rather be responsible for a bad fold job. So we left them for all of you to fold. You can take notes and follow along with the messages with those. Um, each night we'll be going through those and we'll have those on hand if you miss a night come the next night pick up your study guide and uh, we'll, we will be uh, you'll be caught up and so I hope that you can take the time this week to be there with us uh, tonight for part of our compassion project is what are we bringing tonight granola bars and uh, I don't know if we have one to hold up Marty's gonna mention that a little bit more tonight there's an insert a compassion insert so you know what to bring please check that out we're, these, we're compiling some compassion uh, packages for our homeless community i hope you'll take the time to be here with us tonight for some more great music and preaching about jesus amen, amen. last night we our topic was heaven and we discussed that because of our sinful minds and our selfish minds, we don't even know how to dream properly about heaven. You don't even know how to imagine heaven properly. People think, yeah, Pastor, I know what it's all going to be all about. It's going to be about the golden streets and pearly gates and all those things. We said, you know, th th heaven is a real place. It's going to have... A r real people with flesh and blood, it's going to be a wonderful place. But God said, I have not seen nor ear heard what heaven is going to be like. You can't even imagine it. And we said, you know what we often do with heaven? We often make heaven about our earthly curiosities. So in other words, this is what I would like to experience here, and I hope that because I like this stuff here, we'll have that stuff there. The problem is, our curiosities from this life often become a distraction for our heavenly goals. We think about things like love, and we think, well, marriage is love, so I get a little piece of heaven in my marriage, and we say, wait a second, wait a second. Though love is wonderful and marriage is wonderful and having kids is wonderful, it's not heaven. Don't believe the songs. Don't believe the poems. Heaven is something much greater and beyond anything we can ever experience in this life. It is so much greater. And so you might be thinking, well, how do I figure out what heaven is if I don't even know how to dream about heaven? How can I fully understand it? And we began to take that back and, and bring it more to a simple concept. Jesus came, yes, to save us. Amen? Didn't He come to save us? Another reason Jesus came was so that we could understand the Father. Amen? If heaven is unimaginable, then the God of heaven must be really, really, really unimaginable. Amen? So God came down in flesh and blood as a real person so that there would be no more questions. Jesus said time and time again, if you've seen Me, you've seen the father and we established once again here that when you think of God 
we are supposed to think of Jesus, yes! Stop thinking about an old man up there in the sky with a big white beard. Stop thinking about a rainbow. Stop thinking about a heart. Because when you do that, you are worshiping a God that you have created in your own head. You cannot grasp who God is and what He's like without His Son. And we said that this is how all different religions and denominations are spawned because one person gets an idea of what they think God is kind of like and then they go to a group of people and they begin to teach that and those, other, those people agree with them and we, we faction and we separate. What if all of us with all of our heart dedicated ourselves fully and completely to looking at God through the Gospel, through the person of Jesus Christ, with all of our hearts, guess what the church would be like under those conditions? You cannot know God apart from Jesus. You can't. There's hints in nature. There's things around us that hint even so much so that the Bible says that we're without excuse. But if you really want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. You want to hear what God says, listen to Jesus. You want to see what, Je what God does, look at Jesus' ministry. He came to clear up all questions. And so we said since Jesus is the one that tells us what God is like, then He also came for another purpose. And that was to tell us what our heavenly home is going to be like. Amen? You remember that discussion? We said, number one, we begin to realize that heaven is not about a place and it's not about an event. Heaven is about a relationship. And we, we came to that conclusion that, you know, if heaven is about a relationship, then through this relationship with Jesus in my life today, I can begin to experience heaven now. And, I begin, and as I listen to Jesus say things like, the kingdom of heaven is like, it's because in our human sinful minds, our finite minds, we can't grasp eternity. Some people think, you know, it's little spirits floating on clouds with harps. Some people think it's just, you know, we're this energy and we're floating through time. and We come up in our human minds trying to figure it out. If you want to know what heaven's like, look to Jesus. If you want to know what heaven is like, listen to Jesus. If you want to see what heaven is like, look at what Jesus did. That's what heaven is like. And then in John chapter 17, He said, it's when, when we accept Him, when He lives in our hearts, He brings us at one. He brings us healing. He brings us unity and peace and joy. If you want to experience heaven, the only motivation to go to heaven is through a relationship and knowing who Jesus Christ is. Amen. By the way, our message this morning and our message this evening are all, all centered around one theme, and it's this theme. Jesus is our big brother. You know, we talk about knowing God and knowing heaven through knowing Jesus. we got to get to know Jesus a little bit. And we could spend the ceaseless ages of eternity talking about who, who Jesus is and what He is and, and who He is for us. But we need to take some little snap, snip, snippets, some snapshots about who Jesus is. We need to learn a little bit more. And today, we are going to take this theme, that, and I'm going to give you the, the whole sermon in just one sentence. Are you ready for this? Before the world began... God decided that He wanted to be your big brother. We'll talk a little bit more about that and what that means as we move along through our next two sessions tonight, or today and tonight at 7 o'clock. And I want to also make this invitation to you. Tonight we are having a special prayer service for people that are struggling spiritually, if you're struggling physically, if you're struggling with something in your life, maybe it's an addiction, maybe it's a, a struggling talking to your children or a family issue, at the end of the service, we are going to get down on our knees and we're going to pray together. We're going to lay hands on people. We're going to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to move in your life. Be here tonight for special prayer. Invite someone else that needs that special prayer because Jesus came as our big brother to do away with the evil bully in this world. Before we get too much further into today's message, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank You for Jesus. We plead for Your Spirit so that we can see His face today. May we know more about You by looking to Him. 
We thank You and praise You. In Jesus' name, let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this story later on, but uh, I, I'm an only child. Some of you are thinking, well, that explains some things. <laughs> now, don't judge. <laughs> there were times when being an only child had its benefits, because you don't have to share as much. There were other times, though, when I wished I had a baby brother or sister, an older brother or sister. You know, my son, when he heard that we were having one more child, prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that he would have a baby brother. And if you ask him to this day, does God answer prayer? The first thing He will tell you is, yes. Because I have a baby brother. I prayed for a baby brother, and I have a baby brother. You know, something occurred to me as I was talking to him about that recently. You know, my son prayed for a baby brother. And something similar, before the world began, before creation began, something similar took place in heaven. You see, in the foreknowledge of God, God knew what would happen if He created us, didn't He? And so, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I don't want to make it seem like a meeting, like we would have a meeting, I'm sure it wasn't exactly like that, but at some point in eternity past, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the first, second, and third persons of the Godhead sat down and made a decision to make us. And at some point in that discussion, the second person of the Godhead, who we now know is Jesus, went to the Father and said, I want to be their big brother. Make me a big brother. You know, what do big brothers do? They take care of their younger siblings, don't they? They protect them. And they love them. And Jesus has been a perfect big brother, hasn't He? He's been our protector. He's been our Savior. He stood up to the evil bully of this world. Not only has He stood up to Him, He has taken everything that we deserve as His, as his siblings, taken it upon Himself in order that we might have a happy and abundant life. You might be sitting here and thinking, you know, I, I, I grew up, I never had a big brother. That's not true. You've got a big brother who loved you before you were ever born. And he went to his father and he said, Father, I love them. Let me be a big brother. Create them, give them life. And I'll be their big brother. I'll protect them and I'll keep them safe. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 139 that we are fearfully and wonderfully what? Fearfully and wonderfully made. And in order to make this all fit, we need to first do a little bit of review for those of you that have been worshiping with us here at Southview. Some of this is going to be familiar. And then we're going to move into some other things uh, in, a, in a very interesting Bible story as we, as we move along. But let's go back to God's intention for man and why He made us. Genesis chapter 1, and verse 26. In order to review for some of us and for the others to uh, learn this and experience this for the first time. I am learning that I get dehydrated when I speak. So can someone maybe get me some water? I would really appreciate that. Preaching night in and night out apparently is, is dehydrating me. So I need to stay hydrated if I'm going to have a voice by the end of the week. I can't help but get worked up when I preach. I'm sorry. If, if you can't get excited about what you're preaching, you might as well not preach it. So I'll have to pace myself though. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. If you're there, say amen. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Basically, the Bible has told us three intentions that God has 
for why he made us. The first is, in some way, somehow, we look like him. You know, as we shared last week in our sermon, the reason that that woman uh, was symbolized as looking for that lost coin is because it symbolized our relationship with God. You see, on God's, uh, on the faith, remember, remember that when that lawyer comes to Jesus or that, that person comes to Jesus and says, uh, do we pay taxes to Caesar? He says, look at that coin. Render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's. Render unto God's what is God's. Caesar's face was on the coin. But he's saying, give your life to Jesus because Jesus' face is on you. Similar reason why that woman is searching for that coin in that house. But here we see that in some way we resemble God, but you know, we can't limit God. We can't make Him that small because God said, let there be men and women, yes? So that complicates things if men and women are made in God's image. Are you following what I'm saying here? So in some way, somehow, we resemble the spiritual being that is God. But you can't get caught up in that. Like I've been saying, you can't get caught up in the fact that God is this old guy with a big white beard. and It just complicates things. God is spirit. God is fire. God is power. God is glory. God is something beyond our finite minds. Okay, is that, is that fair? The second thing that God did for us, when he, or His intention for us when He made us, was He made us with dominion. Do you see that word there in that passage? He made us with dominion. you see that? I heard a grunt and a groan. Okay. Dominion. Maybe the drinking distracted you. I'm sorry. Dominion. So in other words, God put us in charge of earth like He's in charge of the entire universe. Are you following that? And this was all dependent on the third thing, the third intention that God had for mankind. And the third intention that God had for mankind was that He was putting His glory in us. His what? Glory. His glory. And that's another term for His character. His heart. His selflessness. And basically, because God put, gave us dominion and put His glory or His character into us, all of life was dependent upon that glory. In other words, all of life functioned off from the fact that mankind was given dominion and put in charge with a selfless heart. You following me, yes or no? And we see the results of what happens when man chooses to give up that selfless heart. When man decides to take the gift of life and being made, fearfully and wonderfully made and not use it for his glory through selflessness, but use life for selfishness. What happens to the fabric of life? It falls apart and the earth is bound in chaos. Yes or no? And that's what God says to Eve when, when Eve makes that decision. She says, you know, to Adam and Eve, that you're going you're gonna to reap in thorns and thistles and by the sweat of your brow, the ground is cursed. You're going to bear children. And it's going to be a painful emotionally and physically experience. You, there's all these consequences. Life now is not eternally there. Creation is not now eternally there for life. Life itself is going to be a struggle to survive. What you are made to have dominion over now has dominion over you. And later this week in our, in our, uh, in our revival series, we're going to talk about a big word called theodicy. Can you say that word back to me? Theodicy. And it's, we could describe it in other ways, but basically it's this. It's that God gave man free will. Gave Lucifer free will as well. Gave man free will. And because God has given man free will, and we made a choice to turn this planet over to selfishness, what God has been doing, though His hand is at work in many different ways, God is showing us that the life that Lucifer set up and the choice that we made to turn this place over to Him is falling and crumbling around us. The life that He set up is not sustainable. We're going to look a little bit this week at Bible prophecy. We're going to look a little bit at the signs of the times and realize, you know, they're really not scary for one reason. The reason that the world is crumbling around us simply is to show us that there's only one solution. Jesus is the only solution. It's not our money. It's not the, the, the world that we live on. It's, it's, it's not relationships. Everything. It's not governments. Everything around us is crumbling, leaving only one solution. But when life 
was turned over to selfishness when the gift of God was used for selfish means, all the world fell under the or became under, founded on selfishness. And that's not a strong foundation. That's like the man who built his castle on the sand. You following that? The rock is self selfless love. The sand is selfishness. And every time you use the gift that God has given to you for selfish means, it all crumbles around you. You following that, yes or no? People say, what's happening around us? Well, simply, life is crumbling around us because we've been basing life on selfishness. The systems of our world are based and founded on selfishness. That's why it's crumbling. That's why governments can't figure it out. That's why wars will never, never solve anything. That's why uh, no matter how much money you can possibly make, it won't bring you peace and it won't save this world because it's all founded on selfishness. E even to the degree that when we fight for justice in this world, it's with hatred and anger in our eyes. We want to fight for life, but we're killing each other at the same time. We want to fight for equal rights, but it's with anger and vengeance. Seems a little counterproductive to me. And the reason for that is, all of us is based on selfishness. Even to the degree, if you look in your study guide, Romans 8, 7, it's really interesting. It says, the carnal mind is enmity against God. We in, of ourselves, our hearts and minds became enshrouded and clouded by selfishness. And selfishness itself is at war with God. Life here is not sustainable. And so the life around us that we see is just simply the results of our choices. Now, not everything that happens to you is your fault. That's not what we're saying. We do live in a world where bad things happen to good people. But even deeper than that, we all have to realize that really none of us is good. So it's both those things, amen? I've got issues. And you do too. That's why we need each other. That's what it's all about. Carnal mind is enmity against God. We would be utterly lost if it weren't for the fact... Oh, and by the way, there's a big bully behind all this. There's a big bully that wants you to be miserable and wants you to hurt and wants you to grieve because you've lost loved ones and wants you to, to, to get lost in money or lose your money. He doesn't care which one. He wants you to get lost in your career or lose your career. He doesn't care which one. But we have a big brother who's willing to stand up for us. Not just stand up for us and protect us, but to take on Himself the results of our choices. I want you to see a really interesting story from Scripture. Go with me to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 4. This is fascinating. I love this story. And really the story begins with a loving and humble woman named Hannah. Hannah was praying one day for what? A son, that's right, she did not have a son. And she was in the, in the sanctuary of God and she was praying to such a degree with such force and passion that Eli the priest thought she was drunk. She says, I'm not drunk, I'm, I'm full of love, I, I want to have a son. Hannah has her son. And does she keep that blessing for herself? What does she do with that blessing? She gives it back to God. Amen? You see, my friends, when you're given a gift, you return it to God, it will never return to you void. When you're given a gift from God and you use it for yourself, it always ends in chaos and disaster. 
Think about these. I mean, just think about the principle. I'm going to cure an addiction for an addiction. I'm going to get money and I'm going to use it for my own pleasure. Five minutes later, I'm just as sad as I was before. <laughs> I, I, I'm missing out on this part of life, so I'm going to go live for pleasure over here to try and fix this, this issue. And you never have any peace. The same goes for salvation. When Jesus comes into your life, the question is, what are you going to do with it? Am I just going to hoard the blessing for myself? Or am I going to get myself in line and in tune with God's true purpose for my life? To live for love. Not to live to get, but live to give. Let's look. So Hannah, and there was an issue during, in the days when Samuel was born. And the fact that it says there was no open revelation, it says in the story. And basically what this is saying is that God was not appearing to or talking to any, any of the prophets openly at that time. There was a major problem. But something incredible happens. When Samuel comes along, because Hannah had been given that blessing, she gives that blessing back to God in service for the Lord. I need to back up in the story. Eli had a big problem too. His sons were awful. Perhaps he indulged his sons, but Hophni and Phinehas were about as wicked as they come. They were keeping the, the, blessed, the, the offerings for themselves. They were making people scoff and hate the sanctuary and the worship there. The thing that had been given to them, the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle, the worship there, to reveal Jesus, people were beginning to hate because of the behavior of Hophni and Phinehas. Eli kept his boys maybe for his own self. Hannah got her boy and gave it back to God. Gave him back to God. And so... We, you know, we love that Bible story about Samuel. We preached a sermon about this about a year ago. Remember this story? So, you know, little Samuel, little boy Samuel, you know, we read our Bible story book, and Samuel, Samuel, he's in the temple there with Eli. Yes, Eli, you called me. No, son, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. Goes back and lies down. Samuel, Samuel, yes, Eli, you called me. I didn't call you. And then Eli begins to get the idea, maybe this is God speaking to Samuel. Next time you hear that voice, I want you to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. You, you know the Bible story that we all read and love so much? Samuel lies down. Samuel, Samuel, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And Samuel grew to be a mighty prophet and a judge over Israel all the days of his life. The end. If you read from Scripture, what Samuel was being called to was a crisis, a major crisis as a little boy. If you keep reading the story, you begin to realize Samuel was supposed to go to Eli and tell him that his sons were about to die. It's about as traumatic as it gets for a little boy. You see, my friends, when you're called to something, it's always called to solve a crisis or to be part of the solution to solve a crisis. That's why God calls us. Every time God calls a, calls a prophet, it's to be part of the solution because there's a crisis in Israel. When we pray for God to call our kids, Lord, call my kids. May they be servants for You. Do you know what you're praying for? For them to be the solution to a crisis. Don't pray that they be protected and have a warm and cozy life. When they're called to God, it's called to be part of the solution to a crisis. But that's the place where we're supposed to be in this world because guess what? We gave dominion over to the devil and that's all he creates is crisis. But when the Holy Spirit lives within us and he calls us to something, it's part of a new age, a new dawn where the Lord our God is king because of what our big brother has done for us. Don't fear the crisis because your big brother has been victorious over it. Hannah gives her boy back to God and the Spirit of God returns. Now, it's, there is no coincidence that right after the story of Samuel, we have chapter 4, which is really, really interesting. So we have the contrasted here. Hannah, who gets a gift from God and gives it right back, gets, Hannah gets Samuel, gives him right back to the Lord. Now, the very next story in Scripture is really interesting. 1 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4. Let's begin reading in verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to all, 
the word of Samuel from the Lord came to all of Israel. Now, Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines encamped in Aphek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? They've got a problem, don't they? What do you suppose they do? They get down on their knees and they say, Oh Lord, we want our hearts to be in tune with you. Whatever your will is for our lives, we will do. We're in complete surrender. Please lead us into battle. Our enemies have come. Is that what they do? They'd been given a gift a while back, right? That whenever they took this gift into battle, they mowed down the enemy. We've been given a powerful gift. So rather than going and seeking the Lord with all of their hearts to see what His answer is, Guess what they do? What are we, how are we going to fix this? I know! Let's go get the Ark of the Covenant! Because whenever we take that into battle, we just mow down our enemies. God had given them a gift. What was that gift for? Let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The Ark of the Covenant was for the, sa- for the purpose of showing the world Jesus. And what is Israel about to do with it? Use it for se- their own selfish benefit. It's the same thing that Eve did when she ate that fruit in the Garden of Eden. She was using the gift of life to her own benefit, or so she thought. How did that end for Eve? Chaos. How is this about to end for Israel? Look at what it says there in the last part of verse 3. Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us. The Ark may save us from the hand of our enemies. Let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The ark was about God with us. It was Emmanuel. Jesus was the ark of the covenant when he came to live in this earth. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes or no? It was Christ. Christ was the new ark. Christ was the new temple. He was the new sanctuary. So rather than going down and saying, Oh God who has been with us, who's delivered us time and time again. Oh God who's parted the Red Sea, who delivered us from the Egyptians. Oh God, we love you. We dedicate our hearts to you. They go, we got a problem. I can't pay my electric bill this month. What am I going to do about this? Oh Lord, give me money so I can pay my electric bill. You ever do things like that? Not that that's a wrong prayer, but maybe the prayer should be, Lord, if you don't want me to pay my electric bill, I'm with you. Just give me courage and give me a solution here. Be with me when my lights are off. (laughs) And pray that it not be in winter. (laughs) But you see, when God gives you a gift, you give the gift back to Him. And boy, isn't this a wonderful principle for us to understand as we're looking at, you know, starting to to find a larger facility for for worship and things like this. But here Israel, rather than seeking God, goes and seeks a box, a golden box. And they bring it into battle. And is it effective? Whenever you use a gift for your own benefit, it always ends in chaos. What happens? Is the ark effective? No, they're slaughtered. And they take the ark. I love the rest of the story, by the way. Because as you keep reading, the the heathen nations all play hot potato with the ark. Because wherever the ark goes, it goes into a village and they break out in tumors or a lot of people die or there's a plague and they're like, I don't want it, you take it. I don't want it. We can't give it back to Israel because, you know, they'll come, they might conquer us again. But we don't want this thing. Let's get rid of this thing. And eventually, there's so much mayhem that they give it back to Israel. It's really a fascinating story. They thought they'd conquered. We've got the ark. But you see, Israel used the ark, a gift from God, for their own purposes. Hannah gets her son a gift from God and gives him back. Israel gets a gift from God, the presence of God, and the ark of the covenant, and they use it for themselves. Fascinating. 
I would love to say that the story ends there. It doesn't. Because if you turn over to chapter 8, something else begins to happen. Samuel, who had served his life, or served the people all of his life, his entire life, dedicated to the service of the Lord. You know, something interesting happens in Samuel's life. His boys turn out similar to Hophni and Phinehas. Can I plead for something? Pray for pastor's kids, please. And remember that they're just kids. So if they act like kids, don't hold them to a different standard. Okay? Pray for all of our kids. Love those kids. Love all of our kids. But they're kids. They need to be kids. Somehow, Samuel's kids turn out like Eli's kids. Lord have mercy. So Samuel serves his life for one purpose. To show Israel the true God. To be the prophet of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Samuel comes to the end of his life. He's an old man. And Israel looks to his children and says, well, they can't follow in your footsteps. Not like that. So what do they say? Verse 4 of chapter 8 of 1 Samuel. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old. (laughs) Thanks, guys. And your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. The only thing that I could possibly equate this to is when Jesus is walking down to Lazarus' home and he's walking there and and people are coming up and he hears the wailers. They knew Jesus was coming. He hears the wailers. He hears the women crying. He sees Mary and Martha come up and they say things like this to him. If you had only been here, my brother would not have died. And the Bible says, Jesus wept. Some people think he was weeping because he was sad. He was sad. Some people thought he was weeping because he he felt bad for the people that were crying, and I'm sure that was true. But do you know the real reason Jesus was crying? Because he felt like he could never make them and help them understand. He himself is the resurrection and the life, and he was standing there. They did not understand that if he wanted Lazarus to rise, Lazarus would rise. And he could not make them understand and see who he really was and what his ministry really was. And I can imagine it's that same thing with Samuel here. Samuel dedicated his entire life to Israel so that they could see Emmanuel, God with them. It was never the ark and it was never the sanctuary. It was never the sacrifices. It was the God who is their big brother who loved them before the foundation of the world. And they say, give us a king. And Samuel's like, you already have a king. And I love these next words because this is God's words to the broken heart of a pastor. Look what verse 6 says, But the thing displeased, when they asked for the king, the thing displeased Samuel, and they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they've not rejected you, but they've rejected me. that I should not rule over them. According to all the works which they done since, since they have done since the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so that they are, are doing to you also. Now therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. My friends, this is about to be a perfect explanation of what God must have explained to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden before they ate the fruit. What Samuel is about to do is explain to them is if they choose a man as their king, how life will play out. 
And because selfishness took over, Adam and Eve chose that God would not be their king. They chose selfishness. They chose to use a gift for their own benefit and base life on selfishness. And as we've already said, that's not sustainable. It turns into chaos. And life crumbles. And as we read through this, what Samuel is about to warn the people, what it will be like if you put another king in charge that is not your God, I want you to read this with a dual meaning. One, yes, literally to what would happen to Israel, but two, what has happened to our world because we made the prince of darkness the ruler of this world. Look what it says. Verse 10, So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king, and he said, This will be be the behavior of a king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. Notice that word take. This isn't a choice. The devil takes you by force. The Lord asks us to love him by choice. This king would take your sons. And by the way, it also says that, and if we're reading it properly, I see that this is saying that we will become the fall guy for the devil. We will fall because of him. We will take the the fiery darts of the chaos of this world because of his leadership. Because when it says that you will run before his chariots, do you know what that means? (laughs) Sometimes we have this idea of of ancient kings being really brave. You know, we're on our chariot and we're leading the army into battle. Didn't really happen that way. Because they would have chariot runners. And and Absalom was a perfect example. I think he had 50 or 100 when he was raising up his coup against David there. Basically what it was, was their job was to on foot run in front of the king's chariot to either slow down the enemy or conquer the enemy before the chariot would get there. So it's kind of like the guy whose buddies are holding him back in a fight, and he's like, just wait till I get over there. You're mine, man. I'm going to get you. All the while, his buddies are doing the dirty work, right? So 50 or 100 men, and you can imagine what this must have been like if there's horses or if there's arrows. These guys are storming in front of the chariot, getting mowed down in front of the chariot to slow down the enemy. This is what it's saying. You will become the fall guy for the king, your sons. Verse 12, he will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. He will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. Does does the devil use our sons and daughters for the weapons of his warfare? Has his way of life set up a crumbling society and we are all suffering because of it, yes or no? I can imagine this was the words of Jesus to Adam and Eve. Don't go near that tree. Don't make another king in charge, please. He will take, he will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants. Does it ever feel like the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? He will take your male servants, verse 16, and your female servants, your finest young men and your donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. You will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Verse 19, nevertheless, the people... By the way, the Lord will not hear you. What does that mean? It's exactly what we're seeing today. In other words, when you make that choice, God can't overturn the results of that choice. Once you give up the character, once you give up the glory of God, once you turn this world over to the devil, it's his and it's bound to crumble. You have to see the results of your decision. You have to see what, what you have chosen to turn your society, your government over to. This is the king that you chose. And the reason that God does this is because as society crumbles, as the things and the ways of this world crumble around us, it only leaves one solution for us to look to. 
We have to look back to Jesus. We have to look back to God. And He was the God who delivered them through the Red Sea. He'd given them the manna. He'd given them water to drink and things to eat. He was the God who delivered them. When the society that they set up crumbles, there's only one solution to run back to. The same is happening today. And so that's what it means. But look at, look at this verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, we will have a king to rule over us that we also may be like all the nations. Oh, mercy. Didn't Eve say the same thing? I'm going to use the gift, God, you gave me. I'm going to use it for myself. Give me a king. Make me like God. And all of life became founded on selfishness. My friends, the only way life works is if it's founded on selflessness. When you get something, a gift from God, you give it back to Him and you give it to others. That's when life is at its happiest and its most joyful. That makes life worth living. But here it says, let's use the ark for our benefit. Let's have a king for our own benefit. And what happens to society? It crumbles. My friends, this world is not getting fixed. Because it's based on selfishness. It's not getting fixed. But there's good news. We've got a big brother. You ever have a big brother run to your rescue? You ever have a big brother stand in the way of danger for you? Some of you say yes, some of you may say no. But I want to tell you something. Even if you're an only child like me, you've got a big brother. I want to show you a couple verses and then we'll be done. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. It's so powerful. Back to our scripture reading. Isaiah 53. We're going to begin in, well, let's see, verse uh, 3. Isaiah 53 and verse 3, when you're there, say amen. Amen. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with what? Grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely, listen, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And listen, the chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We turned everyone to His own way. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. My friends, there was one night where the Lord Jesus was on the ground grasping the earth for fear and weakness and pain. His pores were bleeding for such great stress because the theodicy, all the story of our failure when we turn this world over to another prince, when we turn it over, all of that selfishness and all of that hate and all of that pain and all of the, the, the failures of our governments with starving children, Jesus saw it and He wept and He bled because all of that was poured out on Him. He was bearing that load of our failure for you and me. Every crying child, every parent that prays for His for his son or his daughter, every, every time you cry out because you're sad, when our governments fail, when we can't take care of ourselves, Jesus became that that night as our big brother. He heard the cries of mothers and fathers. He heard the cries of starving children. And he's bleeding from his pores. He's being separated because of our sin. My sin. Jesus is being separated from the Father. And he dies the next day. The eternal death. That's hell. 
Jesus went to hell so we don't have to. He suffered the pain of this world so you don't have to. The world crumbled all over Him. The weight of the world crumbled over Jesus. And it separated from Him His Father and it killed Him. He would have died that night had an angel not strengthened Him. The pain of this world was poured out on our big brother, the one who loved us before we were ever created. Hell is not some place that tortures people forever. Hell was Gethsemane. And because God wants to put an end to the chaos, there's one day when sin and destruction and people that will not love God will be destroyed once and for all. But hell happened that night before the cross. And by His stripes we're healed. I love what Jesus says in John 16, 33. This will be our last verse. Look what He says. John 16, 33. This world's been turned over to chaos through selfishness and sin. But all of that was poured out on our big brother and he willingly took it. My friends, because he was dying the death that we deserve, that eternal death that we deserve, he couldn't even see the other side of the tomb. He wasn't sure if his sacrifice would be accepted. He didn't know. He couldn't see through the tomb. And so he did not know that he would rise. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Because your big brother loved you. He was willing to die eternally just to give you one moment of peace in this life and a chance to live in the next. Look what he says, John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Before you were ever born, there was a big brother who knew you. Before you were ever born, there was a big brother who loved you. And as soon as there was trouble, He ran to protect you. As soon as there was trouble, He ran not just to protect you, but to take your punishment for you. Our choice made this world crumble. But Jesus' victory ensures us heaven. You have a big brother. And in him, we know what home is like. Our home is a place where our big brother would die just to give us one moment of peace. Our home is filled with selflessness where life exists for peace and happiness, and unity. Our home is a place that's filled with the heart of God. And we have no greater picture of the heart of God than when His hands were outstretched and His head was bleeding and there were nails through His feet. God showed you His face in His Son and God showed you His heart on Calvary's cross. The Lord said, if you give this world over to the evil one, it will crumble around you, but have no fear. You have a big brother. Do you love your big brother today?
Now we know a little bit about what home is like. And who wouldn't want to go home if you've got a big brother like that? I can't wait for the day when I can run into those outstretched arms. But I don't think I'm going to be able to embrace him first. I think I'm going to have to fall at his feet. You've got to love a home like that. Even if there isn't a pearly gate and a golden street. Even if I don't get to slide down a giraffe's neck, my big brother's there who let the world crumble over him to bring me out of it. Will you love your big brother? Do you want to go home? Stand and sing, my friends. Children of the living God, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ our Lord. We can't wait to embrace our big brother. Amen. We can't wait because he was willing to take the weight of the crumbling world on his shoulders and it crushed him just to give us peace and life. Not only was he willing to stand up to the bully, he was willing to take the beating that we deserve so that we might live. Oh, Lord, we so often use your gifts for our own benefit. Please forgive us, Lord. Yes. We know a life based on selfishness will crumble around us, and we live crumbling lives. Forgive us, Lord. Yes. But today we realize that one has raised us up above the crumbling world. Victorious, not on our own merit, but victorious on his because he said, Not my will, but thy will Amen. be done. Thank you, Lord, that none of us are without a sibling. That's right. We have a big brother who was destroyed so that we might live. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we love you. Amen. Thank you for showing us what a real home is like Amen. and showing us what real love is is like in Jesus name amen amen Let's be seated for a couple of